Good evening, ladies. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Charles Murda, and you are present at a meeting of the Land Use Committee of Community Board 8, the last meeting of this year or this yearly session. Uh, with us this evening is the chairman of the board, uh, Laura Spalter, Assemblyman Jeffrey Dinowitz's representative, the Ted Weinstein, a the eminent oh my god on housing i think he should no. and representatives of the city department of city planning and any other representatives of elected officials okay and our new district uh, manager farrah kill rubin all right um we have a relatively short agenda, which can always be made longer than it should be. Um, the first item on the agenda that I must address is the approval of <laughs> 2023 minutes. Is there, are there any corrections, additions, or changes proposed? Hearing none, may I have a motion to approve? So move. Do I have a second? second? Or any objections? All those in favor say aye. Contrary minded, done. No, that, it's, uh, sorry, sorry, abstain. Thank you. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Rosemary. Uh, uh, absten abstention. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, please note for the minutes that uh, Ms. Ginty has abstained. Anything else? Okay. Now, the first item on the agenda is the City of Yes resolution proposed by the Department of City Planning, uh, the Carbon Neutrality Zoning Text Amendment or Amendments. There is a presentation by the Department of City Planning. Uh, Ms. Thomas, who in addition to you, if anyone in addition to you, is present on that? Hi, good evening. Yes, aside from me, we're joined by Jasmine Tepale from the Department of City Planning. She works at one of our central offices. She'll be here okay. offering some um, technical support, answering questions. Good evening, evening, everyone. Will you be making the presentation, Ms. Tepale? Um, uh, Camilla is actually um, going to be the lead on presenting, oh. and I'll be here for support for Q&A after. All right. Ms. Thomas, you're on. Oh, thank you. One second, please, while I set this up so I can share my screen. Okay. Can everyone see my presentation? You're on. Go ahead, please. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Okay, thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Camila Thomas, and I'm the um, Laura Liaison for Community Board 8. I'm here this evening to talk to you about the City of Yes for Carbon Neutrality. Um, this is a great opportunity for um, our city to update our zoning regulations to help all of us meet our city's climate goals. So City of Yes for Carbon Neutrality is the first of three projects that the Department of City Planning is developing as part of Major Adams's broader City of Yes initiative, charging agencies to take a hard look at outdated regulations holding New Yorkers back from investing in their homes, businesses, and our city overall. Two other initiatives that you might be familiar with, the Economic Opportunity and Housing Opportunity, will be more, will have um, and will begin public engagement later this summer. They are distinct and independent proposals and to avoid inundating community board members and the public in general um, during public review process are being staggered to the rest of the year and into next year. We have been researching sustainability related issues for several years since the zone green in 2012. I'll speak more on that in a few slides. And with this foundation in place, we're ready to advance this work first. Additionally, many of the elements of this proposal are urgently needed, delivering zoning relief to homes, 
and building owners who are trying to undertake smart retrofit projects to cut energy costs and help the environment, but but are prevented by doing so um, through zoning. Finally, the city of Yes for Carbon Neutrality is in the last word on sustainability. Sustainable practices have been deeply embedded into our planning work for decades and will continue to be present in all of our working, including economic opportunity and housing opportunity. Um, so first, I would like to take a minute to frame our conversation. So why are we even talking about carbon in the first place? So it's important to emphasize we are facing a climate crisis, and it's largely fueled by global carbon dioxide emissions. Carbon dioxide makes up a vast majority of the United States greenhouse gas emissions, 80% in 2019. Carbon dioxide generally comes from human activity, specifically the combustion of fossil fuels like diesel, gasoline, natural gas, and home heating oil. In 2016, the world community joined together to sign the Paris Agreement, a vision to curtail human greenhouse gas emissions in order to limit overall global warming to two degrees Celsius, and thus preventing further environmental damage associated with climate change. Here in New York City, we've been implementing this vision through a number of initiatives under the umbrella of achieving carbon neutrality by reducing the city's emission 80% by 2050, or 8050 for short. So what do we mean by carbon neutral city? What we're talking about is a city um, in which we're focused on reducing operational carbon emissions in line with the goals of the Paris Agreement. It's a city where we've reduced our overall energy needs, and to do this, we'll need to retrofit almost every building in the city to become highly efficient to reduce wasted energy. Um, it's a city where we've cleaned our grid, and to do this, we'll need to switch from fossil fuel power electric powered electricity oh, to renewables, yeah. like um, to renewables like solar and wind, and um, it's a city where we've electrified all remaining energy needs. That includes our vehicles and our buildings as well. This means moving away from fossil fueled fire furnaces and boilers to newer electrically powered technologies for heating and cooling, namely heat pumps. As you can see in this chart, the key driver of our city's carbon emissions by far is our building sector. There is a big relationship between our buildings and the zoning laws that govern them. When it comes to our research, we are building on a strong foundation. 10 years ago, in 2012, the department issued Zone Green, the first comprehensive overhaul of our zoning to support emerging green technologies like rooftop, wind, and solar. Um, we did what we could back in 2012, but we could have gone further. In some ways, you can think of our research now as a follow-up to Zone Green, a chance to revisit it after 10 years to update it and to adjust in light of many of the technological and legal changes since. These changes since 2016 include the focus on decarbonization coming from the Paris Agreement and 80 by 50. These also include feedback from architects, engineers, and advocates about issues they identified and ideas for improvements, as exemplified in this report from the Urban Green Council called Zone Greener. This also includes updating the zoning to reflect the Climate Mobilization Act as a city level, at the city level, especially local law 97, which imposes strict fines on large buildings which do not reduce carbon emissions, as well as the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, or CLCPA, at the state level, in which um, particular set, particularly set ambitious solar and energy storage goals for the city. Development of this proposal began in March 2020, 2022, when Major Adams announced um, his vision for City of Yes. Since then, we've conducted extensive outreach, and in particular with practitioners and other subject matter experts to help us ensure that this proposal will be helpful to those who are trying to add solar EV chargers or heat pumps to their homes and businesses. DCP has, has held four open to the public info sessions on this research, two in October of last year and two in March of this year, to which our chair, Dan Garoknik, 
invited all community board chairs and encouraged them to share their information of these events with their board. Also in March of this year, we, we partnered with the Urban Green Council, a recognized leader in climate work in New York City, to convene a group of technical and policy experts to review an initial draft of the proposal to validate the climate goals we're trying to support, as well as the solutions we're putting forward. Along the way, we've been asking experts, nonprofit leaders, and advocates, what do we need to do to help achieve our collective climate goals? How has zoning helped us or hurt us? Um, meeting the challenge of our climate crisis is a massive undertaking that we, am, that we are sure you understand. Um, through our engagement over the last year, we've identified a number of ways that zoning can help support this effort. Tonight, I'll be sharing with you and reviewing four key goals the proposal seeks to support, as well as the 17 specific zoning changes we've identified to achieve those goals. The first key goal is supporting the decarbonization of our city's energy grid. Illustrated on this slide are initiatives already underway at the city or state level. These are not part of our zoning proposal. They are the context in which our planning work is situated. By 2040, the New York State is legally required to achieve 100% renewably based energy grid. To support this, we will be developing large amounts of offshore wind and bringing in more, more clean hydroelectric power from upstate and Canada. However, this transition will need an all hands on deck approach. This includes putting all of our rooftops to work generating energy across the city. To give you a sense of where we stand with rooftop solar, in 2016, we set a goal of getting to about a thousand megawatts of rooftop solar across the city by 2030. To date, we currently are at um, around 300 to 400 megawatts. This means we have seven years um, to more than double the amount of solar in New York City in order to meet our goal. To utilize the energy from offshore wind and from rooftop solar, our energy grid will have to become smarter and more decentralized. With resources spread throughout the city, instead of limited to utility sites in outlying areas. To support this smarter, more decentralized grid, we will need to rely on energy reach, energy storage, excuse me, essentially large batteries, which will act as the glue holding this grid of the future together. To support the ongoing work of cleaning the grid, um, New York City zoning can help in five key areas. First, we can take a fresh look at our rooftop zoning allowances to ensure that there aren't any limitations holding us back from our solar goals. In many districts, for example, there are current, current limits on the amount of rooftop that can be covered by solar canopies. This proposal will update those rules to ensure our roof can be completely covered in solar. Second, we need to take a similar approach for our city's 8,000 plus acres of open parking areas, ensuring that zoning is updated to always allow solar canopies over parking lots. Third, if you want to generate currently clean energy for ut utility customers elsewhere in your neighborhood, through the community solar program, zoning considers that a commercial use. But we need to recognize that there are large residential campuses, hospitals, schools, and colleges in residential districts where community solar would be a great fit. Zoning needs to be updated to allow for this. Fourth, we will need to ensure that safe FDNY and DOB reviewed store, storage facilities are located where they are needed most. Energy storage is currently not allowed in residential districts where customers need access to clean and renewable energy. Sony needs to be updated to add specific rules for energy storage and help facilitate its rollout across the city. Finally, onshore wind faces strict limits in today's zoning without a relief ball for sites where greater heights may be appropriate. The zoning proposal will create a new tool that can be used by future applicants to submit onshore wind facilities for a public review process with the city planning commission. Um, and just to be clear, this proposal does not change the current height restrictions on wind turbines. The second goal relates to eliminating fossil fuels from our city's million plus existing buildings 
almost all of which will be around in 2050 when we need to achieve carbon neutrality. These buildings are by far our biggest source of carbon dioxide emissions. And to improve, we'll need to retrofit virtually every single building to retire oil and gas power furnaces and boilers, replace them with newly highly efficient electric systems, and improve the efficiency of exterior walls, windows, and roofs to keep the heat and cooling inside. It's important to note two laws adopted by City Council in 2019 and 2021 that are crucial here. For large buildings, which are defined as buildings of 25,000 square feet of larger, Local Law 97 will begin to impose fines on these buildings if they do not cut under carbon emissions. Fines will begin in 2024 and will increase through 2050. Second, Local Law 154 requires all newly constructed buildings to be electrified from the get-go. Fossil fuel-based equipment will no longer be allowed in new construction. With this, within this context, zoning can help support the decarbonization of buildings in three key ways. First, zoning can accommodate the increasing need for outdoor equipment, such as heat pumps, which cannot be located in building basements or cellars, to be located above the zoning height limit of on building rooftops. By getting zoning out of the way, will give homeowners, architects, and engineers greater flexibility to navigate their, path, their best path of to electrification. Second, Sony needs to ensure Sony needs to ensure that there that where someone is trying to add thicker insulation or even in some cases for larger buildings, reclad the building by removing an old facade <laughs> and replacing it with a newly efficient one that they don't run into zoning obstacles that prevent them from undertaking the project. Thirdly, we need to update the existing incentive. The 2012 Zone Green Wall Thickness Deduction, which awards a small amount of additional floor area for better than code buildings, is updated to reflect the latest energy code and the best practices for the future. Finally, let's talk about cost. Undertaking this work will not be free. But there are billions of dollars at the federal, state, and city level available to support it. The New York City Accelerator is a program run out of the major's Office of Climate and Environmental Justice that can help you connect with technical and financial support. So before you start a project, please be sure to give them a call. The third goal um, Sony is seeking to support is decarbonizing the private vehicles that New Yorkers drive and own. There are currently 2 million private vehicles registered in New York City, and a tiny fraction, less than 1%, are zero emission. To help owners make the switch to electric, federal and state initiatives are underway. But one key issue zoning touches on is where you can park and charge your electric vehicle. Addressing this need will be key to helping New Yorkers make the switch. By 2035, New York State and Albany has indicated that all new vehicles sold in the state will need to be zero emission. This will also this will be a long-term transition, but we know that the future is electric and more and more vehicles will be electric and will need places to charge. Finally, we also recognize that the future isn't simply focused on vehicles. The more trips that can be made by bicycle, scooter, on foot, or by transit, the better for our health and environment in our city. Within this context, zoning can help support this goal with five key changes. First, allow commercial charging facilities in all commercial and manufacturing districts. They're currently prohibited in about half of the city's commercial districts. Second, allow building owners to designate a portion of their existing parking spaces to be offered as public EV charger sharing spaces, the same rules that currently apply today for car sharing vehicles in existing parking garages or lots. Third, allow for more flexible use of public parking lots, public parking garages, and commercial accessory parking facilities by allowing car rental, car sharing, commercial vehicle storage, and public EV charging within these facilities too. Fourth, expand special rules that only apply in Manhattan that allow for indoor automated parking facilities to be available to everyone citywide. And fifth, update our parking rules to acknowledge the need for public bicycle parking and to allow 
bike parking facilities in commercial districts. Finally, our last goal relates to reducing the city's stormwater and solid waste and helping eliminate the carbon emissions associated with both of those waste streams, so stormwater and solid waste. First, we can reduce stormwater runoff by promoting greater permeability on site. This means less water flowing into an energy intensive treatment plants. Second, we can reduce the energy associated with hauling and processing garbage by reducing the amount. Up to 45% of our waste streams is organic material that doesn't need to go to landfill and can be reused within the city. Third, we can reduce the carbon emissions associated with our food by promoting more local food production on our city's rooftops. So within this context, zoning can help contribute to a better environment in four key ways. First, clarify zoning's paving rules to ensure that permeable paving, which allows water to infiltrate the soil right where it falls, is always allowed. Second, update our city's street tree requirements to allow for new high-performance tree bed types, such as connected tree beds and rain gardens. Third, our zoning resolution doesn't even mention the words compost or recycling. It's time to add specific rules clarifying where these uses are allowed to help these sectors grow. Finally, rooftop greenhouses are allowed on top of non-residential buildings, but to build one, current rules require you to obtain a certification from the chair of the City Planning Commission. By streamlining this requirement, we will allow DOB to review applications for building permits and cut costs and simplify the process for those looking to grow food on their community's rooftops. That concludes our view of the 17 specific sewing changes we've identified to help support the larger project of decarbonizing our city to keep it clean, healthy, equitable for the years to come. Thank you, Ms. Thomas. Oh, uh, you have and, more? I'm sorry. Yeah, no, no, it's fine. This is, um, could be our final slide. A quick note on um, the public review process for the city text amendment. So as a citywide zoning text amendment, this process will continue for the next several months. All 59 community boards in the city will be concurrently reviewing this proposal with their borough boards and borough presidents. In July of this year, the City Planning Commission will hold a public hearing on the proposed changes in August, taking into account that they've all heard the prop that they've heard during the public process. The commission will vote on approving or modifying the proposal and will then pass it on to city council where the council can have um, will have 50 days to ultimately adopt the zoning changes and make them a law. And that concludes my presentation. Happy to take any Thank questions. Mm -hmm. Let me just make a couple of quick points, if I may, at the beginning. Uh, I am distressed that this matter gets to this board, literally, at very last meeting of the land use committee because there are in this board and most other boards no meetings in july or august uh, thereby effectively limiting our ability to act up to this meeting uh, i want to be very clear if there are people who still have questions at the end of this meeting if there are people who have concerns at the end of this meeting that constitute majority of the members of this committee, I will put it over until September. So I wanted to be clear about that because it's just wrong. We made this clear to the commission months ago um, and it's it just making them play or get away from the piano in one session, I find troublesome. The second question I have or second concern I have is a basic one. There is no doubt in my mind whatsoever as to the concept here sought to be advanced. There is, however, the following question. The state of New York and the city of New York constantly make the point that they are opposed to unfunded mandates, to mandates that come from the federal government to the state, from the state to the city, and from the city on downward. This is an unfunded mandate. It is an unfunded mandate by requiring owners of property to retrofit 
that it's clearly in the public good, but is it appropriate to be an unfunded mandate? Let's take a look at the mandate as it was translated, in my view, highly improperly by the city council with respect to buildings such as the, ama the amalgamated. There, those people are in real trouble financially and being able to keep up their costs and the like in order to comply. Simple answer would have been, if it's an important thing as I do believe it is, the city ought to help pay for it. And you can do that by reducing the real estate taxes on those people and buildings that comply. But to provide an unfunded mandate as this is in so many respects, I find troublesome. So for example, not only do you have it with the retrofit, but you have it with the onshore wind. You're going to require people to take care of the appropriate construction to permit of this kind of height, or with the automated parking, or with the food panels. I mean, on the you have this conference. It's a great idea to build a plant or a facility to grow food on the roof. It's also a great idea to have a roof panel, but you can't have both because those buildings don't have roofs in most cases large enough to support both. And the cost of the, food, of the roof panels is one that is borne in major part by the building owners or tenants. I think you need to examine this unfunded mandate thing. And I think you need to come up with a proposal. Providing ways you can borrow money or providing ways in and by which people can get funding if they go through 15 hoops this is not an answer. It's a simple one. Reduce the real estate taxes. It's important. Share in the importance. I'm sorry I've taken so much time. The first speaker is Lee Chong. I have a question in terms of the process. I, I think we need to do this. However, has anyone considered the possibility of a blackout? We've had blackouts in the past. And we'll probably have, we're gonna, we're in essence increasing the use of electricity. So has anyone worked on that process? DCP? Um, yeah. Um, Jasmine, do you wanna take this? Yeah, sure. So for blackouts, you know, that's definitely a reality for so many neighborhoods across New York City. Um, I don't think that's like um, anything that's not like common across New York City, but I think when they were trying to study what would it be like to add more of like electric equipment, it was kind of like a twofold conversation that like one, when we talk about like all this need to like be greener and be like, you know, move towards a sustainable city, um, the actual like principle behind it is that we should make like our homes and our buildings more efficient first before electrification. So what that means is like making sure that air is not leaking through like our windows and making sure that like, um, you know, our, our homes are like padded enough that like things are, are working like as efficient as possible. So like the second part of that is the electrification afterwards. So the idea that this is going to be a long term process, electrification isn't going to happen like overnight over the next five years or probably not even the next 10 years like slowly all this technology is gonna get added on when people can buy them, when people can install them. Um, but the idea is that because this is such a long-term process, Con Ed is working on trying to upgrade the outer borough grids to like help with this future that um, New York is trying to move towards. And so it's like a combination of things of like working in parallel that like, we're just like a first step in a lot of steps across New York City. Um, this is just changing the underlying rules so that people can do these things. And that way it opens up more room for like policies for like more support to the energy grid and more support um, for like this kind of technology. Uh, but this is just kind of like step one in the process. David Gilman. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, yeah, I've got a bunch of questions here. First of all, let me start off by saying that uh, I very much support the principles intended here. However, um, as, as Chair Merdler says, it's going to be very expensive. And in a future vein, absolutely. Uh, I think we should be evolving. And it, it's interesting because Ms. Thomas 
your presentation is talking about doing and mandating and an end date. Yet, uh, Mr. Pali, um, you, you seem to be talking about uh, that's a direction, a way we want to go. So I'm a little confused by that. And I, you know, I, I, I want to say that I was very heavily involved, intricately involved with our effort to get um, high pressure gas up here in Riverdale and convert from dirty uh, number six oil to uh, uh, to uh, gas. And um, my, I helped to convince my own building, but many buildings up here to convert to gas for just this reason, uh, you know, uh, for uh, uh, carbon and pollution, et cetera. And, uh, you know, it, it, it was a big uh, um, bite for us to do it, but uh, we did it. But this, this new uh, unfunded mandate, yeah, that's a very, very big concern. But to, so I, I wanted to get that point across, but I have two specific questions. On slide number four, you show um, the uh, the amount of um, energy used in 2005, and then the intended in uh, uh, 2050. I wonder what where we are on that scale now, particularly because many of our buildings did convert to gas, which would have should have uh, should show a dramatic change in that 2005 number towards the 2050. Uh, and the other is I, I would like to get some statistics on the megawatts of energy used in the city of New York and anticipated around 2050. You, you know, obviously it, it is an estimate, but also our current and intended um, uh, sources for those megawatt hours, or, or probably gigawatt hours, actually, um, and possibly even terawatts. But um, uh, so I think the chair raises a very, very important uh, consideration in terms of um, where the funding is going to come for these uh, unfunded mandates. Um, I, I think a, a complete changeover to electric uh, for all of our buildings, while plaudible. I don't think is plausible um, in the future uh, for new buildings. Absolutely, we should always be going that way. Uh, but uh, part of my concern is also that we are, you know, taking on these efforts while those around us take don't take on such efforts, and they get to, you know, we get to, um, as always is the case, we get to uh, breathe their dirty air. Um, so. Uh, I'd, I'd, I'd really like for you to really uh, go back and look at the numbers in terms of what it will actually cost buildings. And it's not that, you know, that landlord, it's us. We will be paying for this. And then the, those numbers on uh, slide number four and the megawatt hours. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. Uh, oh, um, go ahead. Sorry. Um, sorry. I think also to answer your first question, um, I apologize if that was a bit confusing during the presentation, the way I answered the other question, but um, the this proposal from the Department of City Planning, um, this is just a proposal to change the zoning text. Um, so because we're changing rules in our zoning text, it applies citywide. Um, but our rules that we're changing is just to make it easier um, to be able to put up this kind of technology and make it easier to be able to retrofit and make it easier um, for other green technology across the city. Um, this proposal isn't mandating anything in the sense that it's requiring building owners to put up solar panels. It's not requiring for energy storage or requiring for retrofits. But I will say that there are other city policies and initiatives like um, the um, the bill that was passed from the city council a few years ago called Local Law 97, which I think is the local law that everyone's referring to here that's mandating um, many buildings over 25,000 square feet to upgrade their building so that they're more energy efficient. Um, when they ended up doing that, uh, passing that local law, um, we were tapped in because they saw that like zoning was a big challenge for people to be able to, you know, retrofit their buildings. So this is kind of one of the bases where this ended up getting started that we're like, oh yeah, we really need to update and modernize our zoning 
text because it's really out of date and it doesn't account for all this new like technology that wasn't around the 1960s. All right, well, to be clear though, you talk mm -hmm. about um, facilitating things within the zoning, but also uh, Ms. Thomas talked about uh, escalating fines. That is also part of Local Law 97. Um, I, again, I apologize if the way that it was written, but that's um, all a part of Local Law 97, but not a part of this initiative. Um, so that's already in place. Would you would you be prepared to recommend the modification or repeal of Local Law 97? I mean, a lot of boards do have similar concerns specifically to Local 97. I think that's a bigger um, conversation um, that I think like we should all be having, especially like with our council members and with um, other um, people in government. But I think it kind of goes beyond like our agency as well. Would you oppose or be object to any approval of this being subject to the repeal or modification of Local Law 97? No, I mean, you're well within your rights to, you know, ask for like um, more information on local on 97. Um, I think the only thing that I could say about that between like our proposal and local on 97 was that local on 97 was passed a few years ago. And this is um, different than that, but it is related because it's helping um, be able to comply with local on 97. Bob Bender. Thank you, Chuck. Um, yes, I, I take the point that um, the zoning uh, text amendments are not the same thing as Local Law 97. They are, of course, intended to make possible the implementation of Local Law 97. But what what's happening here uh, in this presentation is we're now beginning to understand precisely what's involved in meeting the requirements of Local Law 97. And we see these solar retrofits and um, wind installations and so on. Uh, and it's becoming clear that this is going to be a very expensive process. And that's that's the point that uh, every speaker uh, before me has made and, and which I wish to reiterate that this is going to be a very expensive undertaking. Um, I, I have uh, two more things I want to say very briefly. First of all, I want to commend you for using the terms climate crisis and climate emergency, which I think are the right terms. Calling it climate change is too benign. Uh, you know, we're in a we're in a very critical state right now uh, that is only going to get worse because we've already passed the point where we can make it better or stop making it worse. It's going to continue that way. So uh, again, like every speaker before me. I, I commend the goals here, but there is a very serious financial issue here that has to be addressed. And uh, I, one other thing I wanna raise, it's clear that uh, I, I'm not sure who oversees this whole process, whether it's DOB or whether it's uh, city planning, but it's we're talking about thousands and thousands of buildings that are 25,000 square feet or more that's going to require a small army of people to make sure that the process is being carried out correctly, not to mention uh, a rather larger army of technicians to actually do this, the, the solar retrofitting, the, the, uh, the wind installations, the heat pumps, and so on. You know, this is thousands and thousands of buildings that, that have to do this. That's, I, I don't know where all these people are, who are going to oversee the process and the people who are actually going to do it and implement it, uh, who have that technical capability. And I don't know whether that's a question that you've addressed at this point or are prepared to address. Thank you. Are you prepared to address it then? Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I think to your, you had like two main points. Um, going back to cost, I know I didn't get to answer this earlier, Right now we have two resources that um, I can have Camilla send um, a link to these to the board. Um, number one is the resource called New York City Accelerator. They're part of the mayor's office of climate and environmental justice. Um, they have a program where they offer free consultations to owners 
um, to help connect them with resources. So like all that funding that's becoming available from the federal government is getting um, sorted down to the state and then to the city. A lot of those programs are still being worked out. Um, so we don't have like exact like there's this program that you can apply to kind of conversation, but they do have like more of that technical um, expertise so that they can like kind of do like a, an assessment of like your building, your home, et cetera, and see what's available right now and help connect you that way. The second resource, um, NYSERDA, which is our state energy um, office, they have a page called NYSERDA IRA. And again, like we can send these links over to you all in, a, in an email. Um, but they have a pretty clear website that shows all the tax credits that are available right now for upgrades to like buildings and like green technology. So we can send those both to, uh, to everyone here. Um, but 100% um, hear you all out that this isn't gonna be cheap. Um, this is gonna be very expensive. And I think it's a concern that a lot of boards share. Um, and I think- you, Let me yes. ask a question again. I'm sure. trying to test this and I'm not trying to monopolize it. We're no. I'm Go trying for it. to find, get one question. It is not unusual for city planning in various text changes to make them effective as of a certain date. And the question I have is, can the effective date of any compulsion that involves any of these things is deferred two or three years from now so that we can get people have the resources to act planning to act, the time to act. The people who live in the amalgamated, it's a classic example for this community. That is a moderate to low income building there or group of buildings where they had to deal with the issue of uh, local law 97. And the issue I have here is I don't want people to have to go through the angst that the people over at the amalgamated did throughout the city of New York. So would you consider taking back to your chair the concept of making this effective in 2025 or 26 and any compulsion in and involving it so that people can get to at least think about it. And at the same time, the city and the state and the federal government can figure out how to get money to people who need it, uh, believe me, uh, as everything you hear on the radio, people on how to get refunds, pay me a certain amount and I'll give you, get you your refund. None of these things are cheap. None of them are easy. And yet the ordinary individual is required to lay out money to get it if, if he or she can get it. Again, my apologies for not monopolization. Margaret Ellis. Margaret? Yes, hi. I just wanted to um, reiterate some of the points that have been made. Um, Local Law 11 is a constant ghost that you just keep chasing. Would there be a waiver to delay Local Law 11? I mean, for us every few years, that's 300,000. I assume this is gonna be the same amount of money for us. We don't have the bandwidth as a building, as a co-op building, to sustain those kinds of expenses, not to mention 55% of people's income is going to rent in the Kingsbridge area where rents are already above and beyond market value. Who's gonna bear that cost? And have has the city of New York, I mean, if this is for every single building, why is this not a shared cost where if we're gonna hit people in the pocketbook, uh, why is it not an increase in taxes? procurement, vendors, reduced costs that way. I mean, we, we're next to a building that never does local law. They're not gonna do this either. And I don't think they've even converted uh, to gas. Uh, so I don't think that this is a strategy that's gonna allow people who make moderate living to be able to stay in New York. I, I'm all on board for the theory behind it, um, but this just seems like it's going to further and further squeeze people out of New York. Um, and there has to be that thought combined with the climate emergency. We're all concerned about it, but if we can't afford to live here, we're not going to be here. Rosemary Ginty. 
Rosie. Sorry, thank you. Yes, you can hear me now, right? Yes. Great. Um, uh, just I, I'll make it as, as, as brief as I can. Uh, it was uh, a, a very um, big presentation. It was a lot to take in and probably too much to take in, but a lot to take in. Um, I am uh, interested in one question. All of the things that you are allowing in zoning, uh, I think many of them, I think you alluded to the fact they're mandated by the local law. So now you're changing zoning to allow this to occur because of some of the mandates in the law. Now, uh, not all, but part. And my question is, do you have a dollar amount, uh, what it's gonna cost uh, the uh, property owners of the city of New York to abide by the zoning text? That's one question. Uh, I will go on, let me just go on to my second question, which is more of a, a consideration. Uh, I almost wish we were in Washington, DC. Can you imagine I'm saying that? Oh my God, uh, well, uh, oh my God, I'm so sorry I'm saying that. But if we were, when you pass legislation, there is a congressional budget office that puts a price tag on every piece of legislation they pass. It seems to me that with the legislation that is coming out recently, we should almost have a congressional type budget office that puts a price tag on all of the bills that they put out. Wouldn't that be good for the citizens of this city to be able to evaluate, right? Evaluate um, everything that is being proposed. So I'm sorry, I'm do asking you the one question for the zoning text. Do you have a dollar amount associated with uh, the um, uh, restrictions, additions, whatever that you put into it that, that you want to uh, be passed? And I guess number two is maybe more of, more of a comment. I really do think we should have something akin to a congressional budget office in the city council so that uh, uh, local law 97 doesn't get by without people understanding what it is. You can be for it, be against it, but my God, how can its citizens make a decision unless they have the information? So I, I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm, just, I'm, I'm done. Thank you. Those are my uh, questions. Don't be sorry at all. Thank you. Don't be sorry at all. I, I appreciate though that like everyone's very- Let me very, make the like, point to you. Ms. Ginty was the first representative of the Department of City Planning to this community board and its predecessor, and was a former zoning advisor to the mayor of the city of New York. So she knows whereof she speaks. But please, do you have an answer to her question? Uh, yes. Um, I think for the money question, because I think you had asked like how much money will it cost to abide by these zoning changes? Um, I can ask our team to see what research they've done. I think their initial thought was that because none of this is a requirement for building owners, um, it's only optional. So like the idea, like it's optional for you to put a solar panel if you want to. Um, but I can check back with them to see if they uh, put dollar amounts to like if somebody put up a solar panel, how much would that cost somebody? They did, I, I'm sorry, just meant, I thought when I listened to you that some of the zone, in other words, the law passed and right. all of a sudden city planning says, oh my God, zoning gets in the way of the legislation. So right. we have to change zoning to allow it to happen. Correct. So I understand what your, your zoning thing is permissive, but is it not derivative of the requirement? You're, right, am I? Am I making myself? Is it derivative? No, that makes sense. Yep. Okay, thank you. Um, let me just make one last interruption. Yeah, Eric, of course. I'm holding off on bothering you until you've had a chance to hear some more of the local input. Uh, but if you want to jump in at any point, just let us know, Councilman Dinowitz, all right? Lee Chong. Uh, I just want to FYI you, Chuck. Um, there is something in terms of um, ex extending the compliance period for affordable housing developments like Mitchell Lamas, rent stabilized buildings, buildings that uh, were funded through the low income housing and tax credit. It's actually in the HPD website if you want to look it up. Okay. And that actually, the extension, uh, I think, if I remember correctly, is 
instead of 2024, it's to 2035. Um, is there, before I go to non-board members, is there any other board member who has a question or wishes to be heard? Karen Argenti then. Hi. So um, I was wondering along the lines of what Rosemary um, suggested that um, what would you, do you have any studies or does OMB or does IBO have any studies as to what the impact would be on the people of Community Board 8? And, um, and, the, and, the, and the other question is, do you have any studies on what the impact would be on the EJ communities in Community Board 8 and in other places? Because it seems to me that some of the things that you mentioned, while good, they're not 100% uh, inclusive of things that you could do to stop the carbon from accumulating and may actually be opposite of that. Like for instance, the use of, co of concrete in new buildings is a really big part of the carbon. And by not including that, it's, it seems that you've chosen to do things that are more, have more of an impact on the middle and lower class I'm sorry, than, than on other places. So I would be interested in knowing about those two kinds of studies about that and how you can prove that you're not having an adverse effect on the lower and middle income people um, who are make up a lot of the of the uh, city. And I furthermore, one of the things that you didn't mention was how to help, like one of the problems that we have, you're gonna bring electricity in, there are old buildings, not new buildings, there are old buildings that the landlord is not upgrading the electricity. And so what happens is people can't run multiple facilities at the same time. And so what are you gonna do with that? And, and there are programs for the landlords that NYSERDA to offer, but nobody's looking at them because they rather wait for the person to move out of the building, out of the city, out of the neighborhood, and instead, you know, get somebody else to come in and redo it and get make more money, um, because they don't want to put in all the paperwork that's necessary. So, how do you handle these things? I mean, have you projected how effective your programming will be in our neighborhood? Uh, thanks for. You don't that. have to answer um, all those questions. I'd like to just it's we like I'd like to get a copy of those reports. Sure, I'll talk with the mayor's office of climate and environmental justice if there was reports like that they would probably have it so we can see what information they have and I can have uh, Camilla send it over. Thank you. You're welcome. Ms. Kerman. Hey, um, first of all, Ms. Thomas, that was a wonderful presentation um, and you did a great job presenting it so thank you for that and I appreciate the big picture goals like other people have said. Um, and I also am excited uh, about the idea of, of thousands of new jobs, new startups with this Green New Deal. But my, my concern is um, that there's a, a risk of losing sight of the big picture goal, which ironically is green, but there's also going to be a rush for profits and the placement of charging stations, the placement of sensors and the placement of solar panels. So I'm hoping that you can think of this idea that we really have to be careful about respecting existing parks and open spaces. Um, and so specifically, there should not be charging stations in parks ever. Um, there needs to be zero tolerance for that. And I think that I would hope that this would not be a problem, but it's likely that it could. No windmills in open spaces um, or, you know, shorelines that are shared that are a precious public resource. Uh, so the, and then the second is that if you showed a picture of unused parking lots, I would love uh, if there were unused parking lots in the city, but I, I would really hope that there could be a firm set aside that unused parking lots don't just become solar farms, that there could actually be a big chunk that's set aside to become foliage, to become trees. Um, and, and so I, it would be great if there could actually be a mandate that, especially in um, lower income areas, which we have a divided district where half of the, uh, you know, there's an area that has a lot more pavement, a lot fewer street trees and much lower percentage of tree, tree bed canopy. 
Um, those areas also are, are hotter in the summer and more prone to flooding. So those areas, there should be set aside that those parking lots don't become solar farms. Instead, there's actually going to become greener, truly greener, not just solar panels. But thanks. Margaret. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to quickly make a point of Melba's um, comment. Um, I do know that community board um, aid in the district is like might be the district in the Bronx that cares the most about like open space and preserving trees. Um, and it is a question that I've asked um, to our central offices, um, especially how um, this like allowances of things will affect um, the open space and the current like trees that we have in the community board aid. Um, so it's a question that I'm still exploring myself, but for sure right now we don't have um, we're not allowing for for parks to be used as EV charging stations or as like potential like windmill um, places. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is um, and thank you for asking that because it is a question that we have um, that I'm still exploring myself. So thank you for bringing it up. Anyone else? I just wanted to raise one last uh, point on other sorts of community incentives that could be discussed. I mean, one of the main reasons why our building has been considering solar panels is because of brownouts or blackouts. Potentially, we could be saving energy, electricity when it's not used and selling it back to Con Ed or selling it to the city, et cetera. I would also want you know, us to be considering incentives that are apart from tax incentives, but really mean um, a way that, you know, this legislation could protect communities and uh, give us some leverage in this process. Uh, David. Uh, yeah, I just, before we close, I just wanted to check um, on my uh, request of the, uh, the numbers on slide four and the megawatt hours current and future projected and the sources of uh, power for the megawatts like you know hydro quebec and solar and wind and etc cetera, etc cetera, where you would anticipate you know where it is coming from now and where you would anticipate in the future uh who is going to be providing it to our board office sure we'll get that information to camilla um since she's the bird liaison so she'll come back with information and answers very good. Thank you so much. Of course. You have now framed adequately, as always, David, a problem. You and everyone else who has spoken has raised questions as to which we are told we'll get back to you, we'll get you the information and the like. We've been asked to take a vote tonight because there is otherwise no regularly scheduled meeting until August. So what I would propose to you is there can be three outcomes now. One, a vote in favor. Two, a vote against, really probably four, a vote to just table it, or a vote to authorize or request the current or incoming chair to permit a special meeting of land use in July for the purpose of collecting all the information and having it done. You could do that at the full board meeting, but I think that agenda is too crowded. Am I wrong, Laura? I think it's very difficult to have a meeting in the summer of the land use committee because you may have great difficulty getting a quorum. Not as currently constituted, all I need is four members. Uh, <laughs> um, but I, my concern is, I don't see how you can vote on it with all these things to come. That's my problem. Am I wrong to the majority of the board members, board members only? Are you prepared to vote tonight? Would you please raise your hand if you're prepared to vote? Yeah. Not a hand. Can I, I can vote, it depends how I'm I sorry. vote. Margaret, is your hand still up or is that still up? In favor. Margaret. Sorry, I can take it down. David? Yeah, Chuck. Um, I'd like to suggest a middle ground uh, where, uh, as I believe we as a board should uh, uh, state uh, our uh, preference, our direction, our interests in, in the principles of this uh, proposal. Uh, however, we have raised uh, severe concerns that we've asked to have answered and don't find that we have enough information 
to fully uh, approve until we get that information. So there's one other alternative, and that is to vote to refer the matter to the full board and see if they get the information in time for the full board to act on this. Um, I, th I, I think it'll be hard, uh, you know, with, with elections and whatnot, I think it'll be hard to do, do it in, in the June meeting. So how about if we schedule a meeting shortly before the regular board meeting? If uh, GCP can get back to us, yeah, I think that would be reasonable. All right. In the event city planning can get back to us, unless somebody disagrees with me on the board, please let me know. I do not want to prescribe anything that is contrary to your views. And by the way, we haven't heard from you yet, Eric, but we will in a minute. Um, unless somebody says something to the contrary. Uh, I'm going to adjourn this to six o'clock on the evening of the board meeting. If by then sufficient information and answers are provided to enable the committee to act, so be it. If not, <laughs> that's unfortunate. Um, do I have, before I call on, does, Camille, does that work for you? Um, yeah, I just wanted to um, quickly note, um, we understand that the timing between um, like when the public hearings or like the tax amendment happened. And now when we're asking the union boards if they wanted up a hearing, um, it's a bit short. We are giving community boards the opportunity to like pass their resolution in September. If you feel more comfortable and you would like more information in between, September is still possible. So I wouldn't want you to rush on your oh. resolution. And we understand that we personally would like you to um, Give us a favorable support. However, we understand that you have a lot of questions and you have a lot of um, ideas to how to amend and modify things. So September, I feel, is still on the table if you would like to um, reconvene in September and pass a resolution there. September it's up to you, of course. Sorry, I just found it. Madam Chair, what say you? Uh, September. Now, council member, you're it. Thanks, Chuck. Well, 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 first, of course, thank you, Community Board 8. As was mentioned, I forget who mentioned it, but this is a very engaged board, and I really appreciate all the questions. I, I think the way Rosemary articulated it probably made the most sense, which is a few years back, a law was passed, and now, uh, you know, they're trying to make sure the zoning fits. Um, and so, uh, you know, again, I, I really value all the opinions you share, and I know that this meeting is not the end of it. I know that a lot of you will continue to reach out to my office, especially those of you on the board, um, to share your thoughts, especially once you get answers to those questions, it'll probably raise more questions. I do want to make sure you all know, if you didn't see it, there were a lot of questions about Local Law 97. So a couple of weeks ago, my office held a, a, a webinar on Local Law 97, uh, including some of the, the information about the law, uh, information on financing for the law, a lot of the questions I think many of you had were answered at that webinar. That's available on YouTube. And I will share that again with the board office. Perhaps they can uh, share it with anyone who wants to see it. It's on YouTube. It's about uh, an hour long. It was also on BronxNet. Um, but again, you know, again, your your opinions uh, and your thoughts are, are really valuable to me. And that's why I'm on this meeting tonight to, to hear what you all had to say and, and, and the questions that you asked. All right, uh, Marty. He's muted, Charles. You're He's muted. muted. But I was, I won't be as area that as, as I've just been, I hope. <laughs> um, I support your idea of having a meeting at six o'clock before the board meeting, because if there are questions still uh, arising from that session, then the September meeting is certainly available to us. If we wait until September, whatever information we have, that's the end of it. So I would support that. And by the way, uh, uh, Councilman, uh, I attended your session, which I found highly informative and distressing because it's a very heavy handed law. The amount of penalties and more penalties and more penalties for buildings not doing what uh, was anticipated of them seems to come in conflict with this more relaxed attitude 
of what we've been presented this evening. So uh, I certainly support also a rethinking of uh, Public Law 97 in the context of the current information. So I would suggest a, a six o'clock meeting as you suggested. So let me ask the board members, please. Is there anyone who would object to having a scheduled meeting at six o'clock on no. the evening of the board meeting? It may not take on a vote, but it'll provide a, a benchmark timetable for city planning to get us some more information and for us to frame any additional questions. Is there anyone who would object to that? No. All right, then this will, Laura, you muted. Yeah, oh, what, uh, no, okay. Chuck, that sounds good. And it could be further discussed at the land use meeting uh, in September and voted on at the full board in September. And that will give them feedback um, from our from that meeting at six o'clock. And uh, I think we do need time. My I attended the uh, the session on local law ninety seven, and I think that it's bringing a lot of misery to many buildings and many cooperators, and uh, has that trickle down where it will affect tenants. And I think that sometimes goals are very lofty, but implementing it is a hardship and a nightmare. And I think that there are many things about Local Law 97 that should go back um, to the drawing board on. I hope the council is looking at that and you just can't um, find people out of existence. So that's what makes me very, because of Local Law 97, I have a lot of, uh, doubts. I don't have the trust. I feel like what's being presented tonight is the camel's nose under the tent for a lot of more changes that will really be um, distressing to the community. Sorry to say that. I understand the goals, but implementation, um, not good. All right. So, uh, Chuck, I'm just just I'm sorry, everybody. Rosemary. Sorry. That's man. okay. Thank you. I, I try and follow the rules, don't I? I know. I know. Oh, goodness. Okay. So uh, I, I, I think uh, your original uh, suggestion, Chuck, and uh, Marty kind of endorsing it makes perfect sense. There is nothing wrong with having a meeting an hour before our uh, board meeting. Nothing wrong. We have asked a lot of questions of city planning. Let them come back with the answers that they are able to get. That will only help this community, this committee and the community board to come to a decent conclusion. To wait till September and jam everything, all the answers and everything and make a decision. I, I think your original suggestion and, and Marty's endorsement of it, I'm gonna endorse what the two of you said. There is nothing wrong with calling uh, for and having a meeting at six o'clock before the board meeting. Nothing wrong with that. Thank, Thank you. you. So let me wrap this up then. Uh, would the representatives of the Department of City Planning please carry back two of them, the questions that have been posed and try to the maximum extent possible to get us some of the answers before that meeting. What is it, 29th or 30th? Laura. 29, 29. Get it at least. Uh, a June, 20, uh, June 29th, and we will send out an amended uh, agenda with this new time uh, very quickly. All right. Hearing no objections, let me then move on to the second item on the agenda, which wasn't clearly spelled out. Marty, any report on STAG? Uh, we're meeting this week. Uh, as far as I know, things are moving to a conclusion very quickly. Um, I'm very pleased about that. I hope the committee is uh, pleased about it. And uh, I think the committee that we have established and working with STAG has worked very effectively. And we're happy for the relationship and uh, we move forward. I'll have more information at the board meeting because we're meeting next week. I assume that everyone either knows or if they don't, that we're going to be dealing with Mr. Stagg again in the context of the Manhattan College dormitory. 
which is going to be uh, sold to him. Uh, and I think this is the best way to go to try and keep the, any problems there under control. Uh, Marty, our next meeting is not next week. It's this uh, Wednesday. Correct. I'm sorry. No problem. Thank you, Dan. And David, I'm sorry. All right. <laughs> that takes me to the third item on the agenda or the next item on the agenda, which is the proposal for a affordable housing complex. This is not a EULA presentation as there will be one required. This is a pre-EULA presentation on 5602-5604 Broadway, a proposed land use change from an M11 zoning district to an R73-2 C2-3 zoning district to facilitate the redevelopment of the site into a 13 story, 100% uh, affordable housing building with 225 income restricted units and off street parking. Um, before we go any further on this, Mr. Saint Jacques, I believe you are on. Are you not? I am, Chair Murder. Uh, good evening. Uh, have you filed yet, or are you? Have you? given any indication to HDC that you plan on filing there at any point in the next week or two? Uh, we have not. All right. Then I don't need to cross the bridge of recusal. Um, very well. Now, uh, that said, let me put to you a question right from the get-go. It is my understanding from looking at the various maps and the like that your property abuts the Greenway. That, that is correct. And you know that there are some people on this board who have an abiding interest in the Greenway, as they should. And my question is, have you had a chance to meet with them to see how that can one can facilitate the other? We, we have not. Uh, this this is our, our first meeting with the community board this evening. Um, we anticipate that it'll be the first of, of many. As you noted, this project is um, has not yet been certified. It's not in ULERP yet. Um, so what we're here to do tonight is, is really to introduce the project uh, and start a discussion going forward with the community board. Um, and you know that's that's really our, our intent here tonight. So we're happy to have those meetings um, and I can provide my contact information as needed to set those up. Mr. Saint-Jacques, the chairman of the special committee on the Greenway, Bob Bender, is on. And Bob, if you will get in touch with Mr. Saint-Jacques, I have found him most cooperative. He is at the Ackerman firm in New York, and you can work with him to deal with some potential issues you may or may not have or concerns. All right. Thank you, Chuck. This is just to be clear, this is a separate Greenway issue from the Hudson River Greenway, which is the committee I chair. This is this is the Greenway extension. Uh, that is part of the uh, Tibbetts Brook Daylighting Project. CSX. That, yeah, see the, the former CSX property, which takes uh, takes in an area from Van Cortland Park South to West 230th Street. But you're quite right, Chuck, to raise the issue. And we do need to engage in a dialogue to make sure that nothing um, that's being proposed would in any way interfere with uh, the intention to convert the uh, former CSX property into a, a greenway and, and to daylight to its brook there. So then let me suggest that uh, the chair or the incoming chair, the current chair, uh, give some consideration to having either the current greenway committee or some other committee uh, take a look at interfacing with Mr. Saint-Jacques and seeing how we can best accommodate both. Rosemary. Thank you, Chuck. Just to add uh, somebody else that maybe Mr. Sanjak should, no, I would recommend should engage with. This is in the middle of the Kingsbridge uh, Business Improvement District. Uh, it's quite extensive. It's been with this community for many, many years. And that that is another uh, engagement that Mr. Sanjak should consider as he goes forward with his project. Thank you. Thank you for the, the suggestion. That's um, we're, we're happy to do that. And really, I, again, the, the reason we're here tonight is 
is to start the outreach pro uh, uh, process. We've been working on this project internally and with the Department of City Planning. Um, and this is really our, our first time to present it publicly um, as uh, you know, we're, we're well before the public review process would start, but we wanted to start getting feedback about the project before we uh, proceed too far. Having put the cart before the horse so far, um, you, Bob or Laura, if somebody can arrange how you want to deal with that interface, uh, I do think the sooner the Greenway piece of it gets plugged in, the better off everybody's going to be. All right. Chuck, absolutely. Um, in fact, Effie Ardizoni from DEP, our liaison, is on this call tonight to learn about the project and to see the presentation. And uh, we will definitely put all the um, stakeholders and the parties together. Definitely. Thank you, Laura. Mr. Zarjak, you're on. Tell us what this is all about. Great. Thank you. Um, if I may have permission, oh, I do have permission to share my screen. Just bear with me one moment, and then I'll introduce the project team, uh, run through. Great. Uh, just bear with me one moment. If I may add a comment uh, while you're doing that, uh, for the uninitiated, the site is where, on, on Broadway, uh, the east side of Broadway, where Magoo's Pub is. It's a T-shaped or V-shaped uh, property that I'm sure you'll go into, but for those who aren't familiar with those blocks. Great, th thank you. So I'll, I'll, I'll get into to detail, I'll show everything and some maps and photos as, um, of the existing conditions as, as well as, as what we're proposing to do. But I'll introduce myself. I'm Frank St. Jacques with, with Ackerman. We're Land Use Council. Um, I have a, a brief presentation, but first I wanted to introduce uh, the owners of the site. Uh, Muhammad Yugobi and, and Mariam Yugobi, um, they're here. I'll, I'll let them just say a, a, a quick word of introduction in a moment, um, but also note that I'm joined uh, by Ron Shulman of Best Development. Uh, he's uh, uh, working on the affordable housing piece of this project. Uh, our architect is GF55. Uh, I believe uh, Ivan Sherbakov is here from GF55. Uh, our environmental consultant is not here tonight. Um, they are just starting their work on the site. So at future meetings, we're happy to have them uh, 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 present, um, but we're using Sam Schwartz engineering. Um, so if, if I may, I'll, I'll just turn. Traffic? Are they doing the traffic calls? They will be doing the traffic, yes. Uh, which I, I know is a, a critical piece of, of every project, but in particular um, uh, interest to, to this project. Um, so I'll, I'll just briefly have the owners of the site uh, introduce the, themselves, then I'll cover the, the project details and turn it over to Ron uh, to discuss the affordable housing details. Um, Mom and Miriam? Um, hi, everyone. I'm Mariam Yagubi. Uh, my brother and I have been, have been raised really um, on and around this property since uh, the last almost 40 years now. Um, I'll let Mohammed tell you a little bit more in detail. Thanks. Uh, good evening, everyone. Hope everybody's doing well. Thanks for your time tonight. Yeah, as Mariam uh, mentioned, we've been a part of the Riverdale community since 1985. Um, our father purchased uh, one of the properties there uh, at that time. And I, as a, as a young teenager, was working there. I subsequently actually went to school at Manhattan College. So um, and we're still obviously very integral and, and connected within the community as well. But, um, you know, we, we are advocates for doing good and improving uh, the community. And as a result, um, reading, uh, you know, what the city has been trying to do, reading what the highest requirements are for our community in the Riverdale area, um, housing, 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 right? That's always what comes up. And um, we feel like we have a really good opportunity to bring affordable housing to the community and be a service to the community that has given us really so much. Um, so, you know, I'm gonna turn it back to, uh, to Frank and, and Ron to walk you through our proposal and um, look forward to hearing your feedback. Great, thanks so much, Mohamed. Um, so, and and I before we we jump in, I just want to say thank the community board for for allowing this this uh, chance to present um, uh, before we we um, move the project further. Um, so 
big picture, we're here tonight uh, to discuss an application to the Department of City Planning for a rezoning uh, regarding the property at 52, excuse me, 5602 and 04 uh, Broadway. Uh, the proposed rezoning would facilitate the redevelopment of the site with a new 100% affordable uh, residential building. This would have 226 units and also have a 188 space uh, parking garage. So the site, as, as uh, noted at the outset, is located on the east side of Broadway. It's just north of the West 231st Street. Uh, um, it, it, excuse me, just north of West 231st Street, um, and it's adjacent to the 231st Street station. Um, you can see on, on these uh, few maps here the context of the site within uh, Bronx Community District 8, uh, and then on the Zola map um, showing some of the footprints of the surrounding buildings, the site itself is, is highlighted, uh, and then some of the zoning districts. Um, the block is roughly bounded by, by Broadway, West 231st Street, uh, the Major Deegan Expressway, uh, and 233rd Street to the north, and then intervening between the Major Deegan and, and the rear uh, lot line of the site uh, is, is the Greenway. Um, that was um, so the, the proposed development site consists of uh, two tax lots um, that are roughly uh, 30,000 square feet. It's a flag shaped lot, as you can see uh, from, from these, these various maps. Uh, and it has only 56 feet of frontage along Broadway. Uh, and then, then the more, majority of the site at the rear has no street frontage. Um, and on this, uh, these zoning maps and an inset showing a detail of the zoning map, you can see that the site is currently zoned M11. Uh, this M11 zoning was uh, mapped back in 1961, um, as was the R6 that, that surrounds the site. Um, the R6 is, is generally mapped just south of the site into the west and then across the, the major deacon uh, to the east. Um, there's commercial overlays, uh, uh, C1 and, and C2 overlays within the R6. And then further to the south across uh, West 230th Street, there's a C44 zoning district that was established in the 2009 Broadway Plaza rezoning. Uh, and C44 is, is um, considered an R72 residential equivalent. Um, Broadway is, is considered a wide street pursuant to zoning that's at 100 feet wide. Uh, obviously, the elevated uh, one train runs uh, along Broadway. Um, as I noted, the site's adjacent to the 231st Street station. Um, and then the Major Deacon uh, to the east is also considered a wide street at um, over 100 feet wide. Um, so we're moving forward uh, to the site itself, uh, here's a few photographs. As, as you can see, the elevated infrastructure for the train uh, blocks some of the view there, um, but you can see the, that, that limited frontage uh, of the site. Um, the site's improved with a, a parking garage on one of the tax lots, lot 91, uh, the larger of the two lots. Um, as mom had noted, it's, it's been uh, owned by the, the uh, owned since about 1985, uh, and it's used as a parking garage. Uh, on lot 90, there's a three-story commercial building, um, as you can see on the, uh, really probably best on the uh, upper left-hand uh, corner of the screen, that photograph there. So, as I noted, and more sort of general terms, this is uh, putting it a bit more technically, um, the two actions that are being sought are the first is a zoning map amendment to change that existing M11, uh, which is a manufacturing district that uh, does not allow any residential development, uh, to an R73 with a C23 commercial overlay. And then the second is a zoning text amendment um, to establish a mandatory inclusionary housing or MIH area. So the R73 would allow the development of, uh, or allow residential uses um, within the proposed rezoning area at a maximum FAR or floor area ratio of 6.0. So that would be six times the lot area of the site uh, would be the maximum floor area permitted and a maximum height of 135 feet or 13 stories uh, with what's called a quality housing building. Um, and then MIH, I'm sure that the board is familiar, uh, requires permanently income restricted housing uh, for a percentage that's between 25 to 30% of the residential floor area. 
Um, I'll note that an additional percentage is required for projects that are 100% affordable uh, financed by, by HPD. So uh, a project like this, which is 100% affordable, um, a portion of it would be uh, uh, compliant with MIH, uh, and then an additional portion above that 25 to 30 uh, percent um, would also be required to be um, permanently income restricted uh, to comply with the MIH um, or the, the HPD term sheet. So the current zoning is, is shown on the left-hand side of the screen with the site highlighted, and the right-hand side of the screen shows the proposed uh, R73 C23 zoning. Uh, it's essentially taking um, from the uh, zoning district boundary of the R6 immediately to the south, um, uh, roughly covering the site uh, within 220 feet of the uh, street line of, of 233rd Street to the north. Um, I'm sure the board's familiar with, with this site. The, the proposed new community district office is, is directly north of the proposed rezoning area uh, along uh, West 102. West 231st Street. So here are several project details. I, I noted uh, to the uh, community board staff earlier today that I'd, I'd send this, this uh, presentation over. Uh, I'll do so so that can be distributed uh, to the community board members that are present tonight. Um, this would be a 13-story building, uh, again, rising to a maximum height of 135 feet. Uh, it's just shy of 190,000 square feet of floor area representing that 6.0 floor area ratio. Um, what's worth noting is, is that about uh, 8,200 square feet of space within the building would be reserved for amenity or recreation space. Um, and it's roughly split between both interior and exterior space. And I'll show you that uh, on, on plans in a moment. Um, Ron will get into the details uh, with respect to the uh, income restricted uh, apartments in a moment. Um, this would be uh, a 100% uh, affordable building pursuant to one of HPD's term sheets. Um, I want to note that the uh, unit distribution, uh, the sizes of the units proposed here are roughly 50-50 uh, in terms of a split between studios and one bedrooms and two and three bedrooms. So we have uh, approximately 24% studios, 25% one bedrooms, 40% two bedrooms, and then 10% uh, three bedrooms. Uh, the, with respect to the parking garage, um, and again, I'll show you this in plan, um, this would be a cellar and subcellar uh, dedicated to parking, which is not typical in a, an affordable housing development, um, but we recognize that the parking garage that is there today is a resource for the community. Uh, and the goal was to uh, um, continue to provide parking uh, for the community. The uh, uh, lot would be uh, attended, um, enter, uh, accessible by um, Broadway, similar to the existing parking uh, facility. It would also have electric vehicle charging stations, uh, as well as bicycle parking. And then finally, I just want to note, I'm sure everyone's familiar that there is um, good access to mass transit from the site. It's um, considered to be within the transit zone uh, for zoning, uh, particularly because of its, its adjacency to the West 231st Street Station. But there's also bus access uh, along Broadway and 231st Street, uh, and the Spite and Dival Metro North Station is, is about a mile and a quarter away uh, to the southwest. Okay, so here are some illustrative renderings um, the uh, renderings show the building form uh, and um, how its, it's uh, proposed design works within that, that L-shaped lot. Um, the top row is, is looking generally eastward from Broadway. Um, and then the second row is, is the rear of the building uh, from the Major Deacon. Uh, the architects have incorporated different facade materials uh, glazing um, colors and articulation to, to break up that massing uh, and create more visual interest in, in this building. Um, and I'll show you that in some uh, elevations in just a moment. Um, but we'll pause here at the site plan. Um, so we've noted uh, by shading in green the Van Cortland Park Greenway um, that abuts the rear lot line of, of the site. So development at the site, uh, I'm stating the obvious here, but, but would occur entirely within uh, the owner's property. 
um, and would not encroach in any way onto the, um, the, the parkland at the rear. Uh, we recognize that this uh, greenway is, is is a long time in the making. Um, we've been tracking it, it closely ever since that uh, you know I've been working on the project, uh, and we're really excited to see that that um, Parks finally uh, was able to acquire the site. That has an implication for um, uh, for zoning for the project, um, and it's it's clear here on the site plan. But essentially, a a thirty foot uh, rear yard is required um, between. The, uh, the building and that rear lot line. So you can see the building is set back 30 feet uh, from, from the parkland there. Um, what's also worth noting is, is because of this flag-shaped lot and because there's intervening uh, buildings between uh, the, the rear portion of the site uh, and Broadway, another 30-foot yard is, is required um, essentially um, narrowing out the building uh, at the rear. So it's you, you can see that the two lot lines uh, for that that flag shaped uh, development site and and how there's there's 30 foot rear yards on on either side of the building at the rear, uh, creating uh, separation between the proposed building and the parkland and then the existing buildings that that uh, abut Broadway. I'll note that those those buildings uh, are each on uh, there's there's I believe five tax lots. Uh, that are improved with one and two story buildings. Those are each 100 foot deep, you know, standard depth uh, uh, tax lots. Uh, and all those buildings have pretty significant rear yards uh, there. Um, so there'll be a, um, a, a lot of separation between the proposed building, the existing buildings and the proposed parkland. Um, just move forward through a couple elevations and some renderings showing the building in context, then I'll turn it over to Ron uh, and we can wrap up and, and answer specific questions. Um, so this is a, a, a illustrative rendering from um, Broadway. Uh, we've shaded out the transit in infrastructure as, as well as the those, those buildings that abut Broadway. Uh, so you can see the building form, but you can see how you know that that facade is uh, is broken up. Um, and then at the rear, similarly, um, one thing I, I didn't note is that uh, 30 foot rear yard at, at the rear of the site uh, would be landscaped and there will also be flood uh, stormwater resiliency uh, um, or stormwater retention and flood resiliency measures uh, incorporated into um, uh, the, the landscaping uh, through permeable pavers uh, and water, uh, water retention system. The north end of the building, um, as you'll note, there, there's no uh, there's no blank walls on this building. The facade from each side of the building is is intended to be you know as lovely as as the uh, the front and the rear of the building. So you can see the um, the north side as well as the south side, which I'll show you in a moment. Uh, you know, will be treated um, in, in an aesthetic manner with uh, here with brick, uh, as well as from the south. And then I just have a, a few uh, renderings. You know, we we acknowledge that this strip, um, you know, both uh, essentially starting from uh, to West 231st Street, moving north between the Greenway and Major Deegan, uh, and the elevated rail line is is relatively low rise. There's a, a portion of the block that's R6, uh, and then the, the the balance of of the block and the several blocks to the north running up to the park. Um, or nearly up to the park are, are zoned M11. Uh, the, the built context on that strip of land is, is really consistent with the M11 zoning. Um, it's relatively low rise, um, high lot coverage uh, buildings. I, I will note that there are no active manufacturing uses in the portion of the M11 that we're seeking to rezone. Um, but again, we, we acknowledge that this strip is lower, but wanted to provide these renderings to show uh, that there is some context for height uh, within the area. And we believe that this uh, site provides an opportunity um, to provide affordable housing uh, with access to transit on, on essentially underutilized land. And I just have two more of these, these views showing the, the building in context <clears throat> and some of the, the surrounding buildings. I'll say one one brief moment, uh, one 
So I'll pause at this slide just to, to note that um, you know we've we've uh, read the community board eight district needs statement uh, and note that for the past five years affordable housing has has uh, been the top pressing need. This is consistent with with uh, much of the city, but we recognize that it's it's a need. Um, within community to district eight, where about 45% of the population is, is rent burdened. Uh, there is a low vacancy rate. Um, you know, it's it's consistent with the city. Um, and there's really an aging housing stock. Um, again, common problems throughout the city, but you know, they 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 act in concert to really exacerbate uh, the overall housing crisis. So we feel that this project, um, particularly as a 100% affordable project, uh, will help um, begin to address that that uh, housing crisis and the need within community district eight. With that, finally, sorry, Ron, I'll, I'll turn it over to you and then we can wrap up. Okay, thank you, Frank, and good evening, everyone. Thank you for allowing us to present. My name is Ron Schulman. I'm the principal owner of Best Development Group. We advise owners uh, on affordable housing and we've been doing this for the past 17 years and I've been doing this for the past 35 years. So um, this project uh, will, provide um, a wide swath of affordability for residents of Community Board 8 and the Bronx and the city of New York. As you know, with all rezonings, there's always a requirement to house the formerly homeless. So the first um, couple of columns will be 15% uh, required for formerly homeless people that move in, and then we'll provide um, social services to those people to integrate into the community. And then there would be proposed right now, as we as we look at this project, uh, four different income tiers based on the area median income of, of, of the city between 37, 47, 57, and 77. So if you're looking at dollars and cents and everybody always wants to know, oh, what's the rent gonna be? Um, you're gonna start at a low of 654 for a studio and go up to $2,500 for a two bedroom in the highest income tier. In dollars, uh, you know, income, household income, we're talking around a range of thirty thousand to one hundred and forty thousand dollars. So, when we provide a project like this, this hopefully meets the needs of most people living and working in this neighborhood, and anybody who who doesn't live here who wants to move here, because it's a great place to live. You've got shopping, transportation, buses, trains, and now this new parkway right behind uh, the building. So, um, this is the I guess the representational view, it's not cast in stone, but this is a representational view of what the building would look like from an affordability point of view. And as Frank said, this would be 100% affordable. The goal of the project is 100% affordability under one or, or two of the HPD programs. And we um, obviously we have not gotten into ULERP, so it will be revising these numbers. And we've already you know, advised HPD that the project's coming down the road. Um, hopefully we'll be in the rezoning by next year and we would um, then pursue uh, the active financing. We're always happy to come back to the community board to give you updates and represent as we go forward, but this is where we are right now in the affordability mix. We've also presented, of course, to Councilmember Dinowitz's office about, I think, three or four times. We presented to the borough president's office and, of course, city planning uh, has been integral in, in getting this far. Frank, is there another slide after this? That is it, Ron. Okay. Uh, One other note to the community board members. As Frank mentioned this would be MIH, which, as you know, is 25 to 30% affordability permanently. This project will have much more uh, permanent affordable housing because of the fact that um, we're, use, we're using HPD's program. So uh, I would dare to say that most of this building will likely be um, permanently affordable. and um, And that's a good thing because once we take all the time and effort and, and, and money, of course, from the city to build it, it's going to be affordable for the long run for many generations. Um, one, you. Last, one last oh. thing is, as, as the Yugubis introduce themselves, uh, they will stay on as being owners of the building and they will operate the parking garage. So while we're providing the new housing, the parking will come back so the, the community will not suffer a loss of parking. The parking comes back in a brand new garage. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. I'm going to go ahead and pull my screen down. Um, I'm happy to, to bring it back up if, if you, um, we need to refer to specific slides. But um, thank you again for the opportunity to present. We're, we're happy to answer questions. I'm, I'm sure you guys have them. Let me frame three of them first. But let me give you a little piece of history. 
one of the very, very few advantages of having served as chair of this committee for a long, long time is that I know a few of the things that have happened over the past few years. This board voted against MIH. So I thought you should know that. Um, and I think it was almost unanimous. Um, having said all of that, I have three questions for you. Immediately, I think it's to the north of you are two blocks, two lots that had a shaded area. If you'll be able to bring up that map, the zoning map. Sure. I'm just finding it on my screen quickly and then we'll share again. Uh, I'm wondering if uh, is this this slide was um, it was a, a more detailed rendering of the uh, uh, okay um, bear, I'm sorry I'm about to to scroll question forward I'm, question I'm about there we go you just had it yep oh. the the uh, looking at the uh, slide to your left there are two blocks two. Uh, with a shade just below yours. What's the zone in that? Um, can you see my cursor? Yeah, uh, right there. Th this is this is R six. So, so here's that, my question for you. Yep. How is this going to withstand a challenge of spot zoning if it's done by city planning? So I, I have uh, two two reasons there. The the um, the Spot zoning, very generally, and and sort of in a in a nutshell, is is you know would be zoning that would only benefit a single property owner. The um, zoning district boundary uh, would include, and I'm going to scroll back. Bear with me. Um, not just the applicant's property, but um, several other properties that that abut Broadway. So these one, two, three, less, four, five it's properties. Less, it's less than a block. And there are a load of cases that say that's a lot. The reason I'm asking you the question yep. is, I suspect city planning will, as it has in the past, raise this question for you and ask you at some point why it is that you are not proceeding via a um, Board of Standards and Appeals change of zone hardship. Well, uh, you know, uh, we can- we... Less trouble though. You know, the the Board of Standards and Appeals, um, you know, and, and we could have a, a longer discussion about this. You know, our, our thinking was that, um, you know, whereas a BASA variance um, would would require a unique physical condition that that creates a, an economic hardship. Um, subways enough. So, um, I, there, there's a, um, it, you know, a minimum variance finding. And what we really needed to do was was balance the the difficult aspects of designing on this this site, this tax lot that's that's flag shaped. It's against the elevated rail line. It has a park at the rear. Um, you know, there, this site has has plenty of of unique um, difficult conditions. Um, but it it, it also um, what the zoning we're seeking um, is to balance some of those those design uh, concerns with. Um, an amount of units that would present a feasible project uh, for for an affordable housing development, and also include the um, the, the parking uh, garage. I, I think, I, and and again, I can provide more detail on this, but essentially, our thinking was that we have a land use rationale for an increase in zoning based on the proximity to transit, location on wide streets, uh, and the inclusion of mandatory inclusionary housing. Um, we think we have a land use rationale that, that would not be considered spot zoning, um, but I take your point with respect to the BSA. I just I think it's a risk that uh, the BSA may not consider the amount of of um, floor area that that would result in a viable project to be within a minimum variance that they could grant. Um, but it's it's a good question, and and I'm I'm not suggesting that it's. Please understand, I'm not trying to suggest an obstacle. I'm trying to give you a caution in terms of one of the concerns and to point out to you that there have been occasions over the years where this board has gone with the applicant 
to the Board of Standards and urged prompt action if, if the merits are there. I'm just suggesting it to that you can weigh that factor as against uh, the possible danger because anybody can mount a BSA cell. A I, I understood. Second question. It's got 25% studios. That, to my mind, is really high. You have The borough president has made the point. I'm sure she's made it to you. She's made it to anyone who will listen, and she's made it forcefully and ably, and that is we need more family housing. 25% um, of a wonderful building is still 25% of single occupancy, basically. Um, and it seems to me, at least, to be high. And I would ask you to rethink that. And the third point I have for you is this board has, and you have the expert on housing right on here. His name is Weinstein. Don't ever get him out of your sights. He knows more than all of us put together. Um, so having said that, um, there is, we've been bitten once and we have no great affection for being bitten twice. Do we have the owner's assurances that this is intended to be a affordable housing for community residents is not intended to be a shelter or the like, which is what has happened in that immediate neighborhood in the past? Uh, I, I, absolutely. Um, they're, they're here tonight and, and confirm. That's why I'm asking them. <laughs> yeah. No, you're absolutely right. And uh, no, we are committed to this project and we're committed to the community. And uh, the reason we're going down the affordable housing path is because we recognize, as Frank had mentioned, and as, had, as Ron had mentioned, that over the course of the last five years, the reports from C, uh, CB8 and New York City have indicated housing is a major issue and a problem, and we need to help solve that. So like I said in my intro, uh, we are committed to staying in the community and, and giving back to the community in the form of uh, affordable housing. So it will stay affordable housing. All yeah. good. I want to add to that, Mr. Chair, if I may, this will not be a homeless shelter. We're, we're not looking at any uh, ways or means to build a homeless shelter. This is for family housing. And your point of family, we, we, we do homeless have... shelters. I just want to be sure that yeah. people are not misled into a view based on what has happened in the past. Understood. Mr. Gelman. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Um, uh, one thing I would note, uh, Mr. St. Jacques, uh, for your uh, transit slide. Uh, there is no BX2 in the area, and while you note the um, the Spite and Dival train station being 1.3 miles away, Marble Hill is half a mile away, about eight blocks uh, down Broadway. So just just for your information. Anyway, um, uh, I do have two questions though. One, um, does this now or in the future contemplate taking any sort of air rights? from those five uh, taxpayer buildings immediately between your building and the uh, and Broadway itself? And two, uh, uh, would you, uh, have you, uh, or are you contemplating an amenity, uh, um, I'm sorry, a community facility, like an office or something or other that could be rented out by or used by community entities, like in the lobby or thereabouts? Yeah, so to, to answer the first question, um, what's shown tonight and, and what's been contemplated now and in the future is, is uh, development entirely relying on uh, the zoning law itself, the, the applicant owned property. So not um, uh, no transfer of development rights. Um, with respect to a community facility, that there's not any uh, designated community facility floor area. That said, this building um, is is going to be built pursuant to the quality housing program, which requires um, amenity space uh, that, that I, I mentioned, um, including a uh, recreation room. It's it's possible that that, that room could be used uh, um, for the, the community, but we'd have to you know talk about that a little bit further with, with ownership, but we can get back to you on that and I'll, I'll flag that. Very good, thank you so much. Thanks, Marty. Just a little clarification, please. I noted on your slides that the uh, parking area, which you say is going to uh, uh, serve a community interest to be able to park off, 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 off street, but and it says there'll be an attendant. So two questions, is that a 24 hour, 20, 24 seven attendant 
and will be set aside, will there be set asides for residents for parking? So um, forgive me, I just closed my slideshow, so I'll, 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 I'll work without it. Um, the uh, attended parking would be 24 hours. Um, the, the, um, so th that's a short answer there. Um, the residential parking requirement, um, the, the, essentially no parking is required for the residential units within uh, the housing. So the way we're, we're contemplating the, um, th there, there's more than one way to do it, but the way we're looking at it right now um, is to um, allow uh, residential uh, owners, or excuse me, residential tenants of the building uh, access to parking and then otherwise operate um, uh, as, as a public parking facility uh, within the building. Um, we're, we're still working out the details on, on how that would work and how to classify it as, as far as zoning goes. The other alternative, which you know we, we haven't quite figured out, is, is to um, essentially not set any um, accessory residential parking spaces aside and just designate this as a, uh, a commercial parking garage, a use group eight um, that building residents could um, could use. Um, I'm, if, if, let me know if, if that didn't make sense. It's a we've it's something that we've been kicking around internally, so um, still working that out. You've answered my question. Uh, as you move forward, I have a greater concern about it, but you've answered my question. Thank you. Any other questions? Mm hmm. All right, Rosemary, you're on. Yes. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I guess I'll, I'll make this very short. Uh, first of all, can can we have um, can the community board have the PowerPoint presentation you just made? So yes, I'll send that over. Shared? Thank you very much. Thank you. And I think the second one is um, uh, I don't know. May, maybe maybe my eyesight is getting bad, but this looks like a spot zone to me. Um, as a matter of fact, it looks like the definition of a spot zone. Uh, you are surrounded on all sides by R6. And uh, so my question, my question is, uh, did you look to do a development at a density of R6? Did you look to do that? Now, I understand that you, what, and, and why did you choose not to do that? And please don't tell me you're going to make more money with R7. What is it about R6 that you could not do an affordable housing project on that site? Is that am I okay? okay no, no, that's that's a it's a fair question and and you know point taken. I'll start and, and Ron, if you want to um, uh, jump in with with additional detail, but um, R6A, um, for example, uh, it's a contextual zoning district. Um, you know, would be something that would uh, match the existing R6. Um, MIH would be a requirement for a private applicant. R6A allows a uh, total floor area or residential floor area of 3.6 FAR, so 3.6 times the uh, lot area of the site. Um, when we were doing our initial diligence um, on this site, the R6A and the amount of floor area just didn't pencil out. Um, there's, it simply does not provide enough units uh, for this site um, in order to be a, a feasible development. Um, Ron, if, if you want to add more there, um, happy to do so. But in, in contrast, or I, I can ask you to do so, but um, in contrast to the R73, which is, is being sought, um, this is a, a 6.0 FAR. Um, one other aspect of, of the R6A, um, it's it's a contextual zoning district that has a, a height limitation in addition to that uh, lower FAR. Um, so there's really not a, a, a way to develop on the site, um, provide the the number of units that would be required for a feasible development, provide the parking that that um, the owners wanted to to uh, put back on the site, um, and and have a viable development. Right, Ron, did I, did I capture yeah, that? Yeah, I think you summed it up. You know, two other things. We did speak with city planning uh, many times on selecting the, the adequate uh, zoning district, and, and this is what was the collaborative uh, view with city planning and our team and our architectural team. 
Her six sorry, eight. City, City planning agrees with the R7. I'm sorry, am I missing something? No, they do. They do agree with the R73. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. no problems. Um, an R6A uh, zoning would really not be economically feasible, and I don't think the project would pencil out, as Frank said. It's just not uh, providing enough density for the amount of um, the capital that's necessary to finance a project like this. And, um, you know, quite honestly, it's transit oriented development. We're across the street from a subway station. Um, the city planning felt very, very uh, comfortable with this R7. Any of the R7 family district next to a subway station and also um, in a, uh, you know, walkable transit shopping zone, they felt comfortable with it. I will tell you. Thank you for I'm, your answer. Welcome. Let me tell you, we've been down this road more than once, and you should not necessarily regard whatever was told to you in the beginning by city planning as something that you will hear in chapter two, three, and four. So do think about a fallback along the lines that I mentioned earlier. And, and understand I am a supporter of affordable housing. So I want to see as much of it as I can. But I tell you that to mount a challenge on spot zoning with this configuration, Rosemary put her fingers on it. It's probably the classic definition. Yes, sir. And, 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 and um, uh, Mr. Chair, there is R7 land in, um, zoned land in Community Board A, a lot of it. You know, if you need R7 to build affordable housing, then that land exists. Okay, so it, it exists in abundance uh, uh, through Community Board 8. So that's my last statement. Thank you. Please do not take what we say as other than a caution to you, not a hindrance to you. Mr. Ben. <laughs> thank, you. Uh, thank you, Chuck. Um, yeah, I, I, I want to say, um, first of all, I'm very pleased to see that the project is 100% affordable housing and that 50% of it is two and three bedrooms, uh, which I think is something that has been a concern to this community board in the past that too much of the affordable housing that uh, that is proposed is, is studio in one bedroom. Um, and I, I do commend you for doing your homework and correctly noting that affordable housing has been the number one district need in this community board for several years running. So I'm, I'm very supportive of the concept, uh, leaving aside whatever zoning questions, which will be resolved by the Department of City Planning. Uh, I did want to point out one thing, your parking, it, uh, as I understand it, you said was going to be in the cellar and the sub cellar. Uh, you're on Broadway, which is prone to flooding there, there have been uh, flooding problems on Broadway in the past, and I think you want to take a good hard look at that situation um, before uh, making any final decision about where you're locating your parking, um, because it, the flooding problem is, uh, is likely, as we all know, to get worse and not better in the future. So uh, I would just urge you to give very careful uh, due diligence to that issue. Thank you. I'll, I'll just respond quickly to say um, this is something that, that's been top of mind with the design team, uh, really from from day one and and through um, some of the conversations that that we've been having internally and and um, with the Department of City Planning. Um, the lower levels would would be dry flood proofed. Um, the residential or the habitable levels have to be built above a design flood elevation of twelve feet. Um, and then there's several uh, measures that are that are being engineered into the project. Um, we're um, I can actually just show you some of the um, I, you know I'll, I'll send it in the presentation because they're they're an appendix, but I don't want to stray too far from other questions. But um, that's part of an ongoing conversation and something that, that the design team has, has thought about, and we can provide some more detail on that as we move forward. Deal with and, thank you, and I, I, I also want to make sure that aside from your property, uh, that whatever you do there doesn't create more of a flooding hazard for the adjacent properties. Uh, uh, understood, and, and that's 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 definitely part of the consideration here. Um, I'll note that um, not only are we looking at this from a, a design aspect, ensuring that the 
the building is designed in a way to um, address flooding concerns, um, uh, flood resiliency, stormwater retention, um, and, and sustainability. Uh, but we'll also begin um, doing our, our environmental due diligence uh, with an environmental assessment statement um, that will examine on a, on a more comprehensive basis uh, potential impacts of this project on, on surrounding properties. So that's something we're, we're just getting started and, and we can report back um, on, on our progress as, as we move forward. Be aware that because of your proximity to the subway, you are required to have MTA approval. So the sooner you look for that, the better off you're going to be. Thank you. That's that's a good point. I'll note that the MTA is is um, determined that a, a transmit easement, or excuse me, a transit easement is is not required for this site. And we understand that that you know were this project to be approved, um, we'll have to work closely with them on um, construction approval. The distinguished chair of the board. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I just want to ask. Uh, do community board eight residents get an advantage for renting the apartments? Yeah, yeah, it, it's a great question, and um, uh, the answer I guess right now is yes under the present marketing guidelines. But this is a case that has been, I think, litigated, and Ted could weigh in on this as well. Um, the marketing guidelines always state that community board residents, whatever district, have a fifty percent pre preference uh, for the apartments. And that will be advertised uh, and information given to the yes. board so that we could just dis disseminate that. Yes. And also what we try to do also when we, you know, market with the marketing companies is, is, you know, hyper local marketing where people are your board and other community groups are told about the project so that it urges people to apply locally. Thank you. Sure. Nick. One second. Nick, are you there? Yeah, thank you, Chuck. Thank you for the presentation. You said the um, the the FAR of this will be six. Is that Seven. correct? That, that's correct. And that's standard for an R seven, or is that because of the increased bulk provision with the MIH? So it's it's the the R seven three um, when paired with with MIH uh, it is right. Right. So just so everybody's clear. MIH. Right, so so that everybody's clear, the real FAR for a seven is like a three four four, maybe a little higher than that. So this is substantially bigger because of the MIH. So I just think people should know that, right? So to be clear, so we're not just talking about going from an R six to an R seven, R seven plus bulk provision with MIH, whichever option you took, one two three or four. I don't know which one you're going to take, but that's that's what we're looking at here. So it's Right. So, so oh, sorry, sorry to jump in. I, I didn't mean to interrupt. If um, that's okay. um yeah, the, the, to be clear, that's the the R seven as a private applicant, even with a one hundred percent affordable project, uh, MIH is is a requirement. You know, a a private rezoning application uh, also needs to seek that text amendment to establish an MIH area. So. Um, <clears throat> The R73 contemplated here has an FAR of, of six. Um, and that's that's really, as we noted, um, to accommodate the amount of floor area um, that, that allows us to achieve a, a feasible development at this site. No, I, I understand. I appreciate that answer. I just want to make sure people are clear just in terms of the size that we're that we're talking about here. But thank you. Lee. Um one um, update, Ron. There is a pen. It's not pending. There is a lawsuit um, by a group of um, advocates, affordable housing, and that are, are trying to um, eliminate the fifty percent uh, community preference as being uh, discriminatory. Uh, the other thing, uh, my understanding of MIH program is you have twenty four percent, tw tw about yeah, quarter of, of the units are going to be studios. I thought MIH really was pushing more to have family. So two and three uh, bedrooms were what they wanted. And I don't think they really approve of studio. Is that so not we true? Well, again, as we do have 50% two and three bedroom apartments. Um, we'll go back and look at the distribution. I know a number of people have brought up the studio comment. Right. So we'll go back to the archi architects and look at the, the floor layouts. They're preliminary. 
but the goal is 50 percent two and three because that's what we heard from the right. uh, council member we heard it from you know other people around board eight so th that's our commitment is 50 percent twos and threes and we'll see if we can migrate some of those studios to one bedrooms all right thank you sure one one thing I'll note, and and as Ron noted, we'll we'll have a look at it. Um, one one thing our our uh, presentation didn't have is is the, the unit sizes. Um, I, I can I can send that off uh, separately with with the presentation. Is um, you know these are these are relatively large um, uh, units um, with within the the um, different sizes. So we can, we can provide that information. Um, obviously it's, it's illustrative at this point, but it's, it's what we've been planning towards, uh, within the building. Um, but we'll, we'll send that off so you, you can, uh, evaluate that, um, uh, as a board. Ms. Sargenti. Karen. Yes. Um, I was wondering if the parking lot is underneath the 30, uh, foot, um, backyard uh yes the the um and let me just see if i can pull up a floor plan for you no i don't need the i, I know what yeah. but so i just want because yeah. i'm concerned with this the unified stormwater rule you need to absorb all of your water on your property and i mean if you didn't have the parking lot underneath there then that would be a good place to you know take care of the runoff um and I don't know what you're going to do with the property. I think you'll have, you you should be mindful that there's new regulations and that you need to follow them, and that they're really important, especially in that area because it's always flooded. Yeah, we we uh, point taken understood. I you know I I, I recall. You know, seeing that the cars along the Major Deegan that that were um, you know abandoned uh, in that storm, gosh, was it last summer? I, I know this is a persistent problem in the area. Um, the architects, uh, the whole design team is is aware of these problems and the the new rules that that um, have been implemented by the city. So this is absolutely top of mind in, in term uh, terms of design. If you'll just indulge me for a moment, I'm just going to share um, the okay. uh, first floor plan. Um, which just shows the um, these two rear yards um, that would be uh, landscaped with essentially a stormwater retention system, um, green roof over that parking structure, uh, as well as permeable pavers. Um, I, I don't have a section showing what's below that, but essentially it's it's um, uh, infrastructure within the building. Um, to uh, uh, capture and retain all that that, that storm water um, pursuant to, to all the new um, uh, rules and regulations in, in place there. So um, that's something that, that we can share uh, as we advance the design. Uh, and again, as, as we evaluate um, from an environmental perspective, um, you know, demonstrating that this building would not have any uh, potentially adverse impacts on the surrounding community as it relates to uh, stormwater or um, flooding or um, overtaxing the, the existing sewer system, which again, we, we recognize as a, as a persistent problem here and and then frankly, in much of the city. Right. And I assume you're looking at a green roof for the roof. Correct. Uh, yeah, it's, it's actually um, uh, looking at both um, green and blue roof systems, right. again, because um, there's the local law uh, 97 requirements, which were discussed earlier. Um, for this is for a new building. It's of the appropriate size that that um, those requirements uh, are you know come into play here, um, but also to incorporate sustainability um, pursuant to to some HPD's guidelines uh, with respect to sustainable buildings. Thank you. Anyone else? Hearing none, I thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, if you have anything further to provide to us by way of information to pass out to the members of the board, um, please let us know through the community board. Eric, anything? Councilman? Um, not, not same as, um, you know, the previous uh, presentation, which is I value everyone's opinion here. Um, you know, affordable housing is critical. And I do, you, you know, I'm, th this is something I would be voting on if it came before the council. So I'm not saying one way or the other, 
um, how I feel about the presentation, of course, I, I'm going to take everyone's uh, opinion and input here. Uh, but I do want to give credit to the developers um, that I think the original distribution was 30% one bed, 30% um, two and three bedrooms. Um, and so they have increased the number of family units and I, and I do want to give them credit for listening and for uh, being responsive to that need and certainly look forward to continuing to work together to ensure that this, this affordable housing complex, if it moves forward, uh, does need to meet, meet the needs uh, of our local community. Ted Weinstein. You're muted. Yep, yep, head on mute, sorry. Um, just to just really say that um, I understand they are interested in using an HBD financing program, and that's great because that's how we get more affordable housing. Um, I just want to strongly suggest to them that they not hold off. I know they hope to certify the ULIP application by the end of the year. Um, maybe it's just the way I heard it, but I think, Ron, you were saying that, you know, like later on, then you would be coming back to HPD to then seriously start applying for the financing. I strongly suggest that you apply as soon as you can. You know, you know the kind of pipeline we have right now. And I've been saying to people, the, soon, the, the later you start, the later you finish. Um, and I just don't understand truthfully when I hear developers hold off coming to HPD to start talking seriously about the financing, you know, until they were like well into you alert, let's say. So, um, you know, if it was me, I'd be, I'd be addressing both avenues at the same time. So, um, and I'm not saying to anybody to the board that we're <coughs> guaranteeing that we're gonna finance this project because of course, you know, we haven't seen it yet, but I'm saying to all developers, if you intend to do that, then the sooner the better. And my other comment, just quickly, I guess, I think it's a very good site for affordable housing, given the proximity to retail, given the proximity to, to subways and L buses. Um, I credit them. Uh, too many developers, when they build the building, they think that the building only has one side to be seen. Obviously, this will have two sides to be seen, and they're approaching it that, you know, and obviously it's a matter of taste, um, but however good the front is, they intend to make the back that well as that good as well, um, because the back will be very visible. And so we don't want any blank walls um, uh, you know, in the back just because it's the back. Um, so, um, and then just again, to throw out some, some of the facts, you know, 25% studios is our maximum. Um, so they are uh, within that 30% is our minimum for one, for twos and threes. And, and they're 50%. So, you know, this is a higher percentage of two and three family, two and three uh, bedroom units than many of our projects. Um, so again, um, you know, you'll know, have to wait for our finance people to go into the underwriting and, you know, to go back and forth with Ron on numbers, but, um, you know, it's, it's certainly an appealing project in many ways. Thank you, Ted. Ladies and gentlemen, I think that's it for this item and indeed for this year of the Land Use Committee, except for the special meeting on the 29th at about six o'clock. We'll get a full notice out to you. I thank you all, and I wish you all a good evening. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.